one, two. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. All right. Well, th- this is uh, this is a really lovely way to to start the podcast. So I, I'm go- I'm going to uh, tell the listeners who they just heard playing. Uh, so he, as you can hear, he's a true innovator of the diatonic harmonica. He's taken an alternative approach to filling in the missing notes on the instrument by adding valves according to his own special method. He's also recorded and performed with many great musicians over the past 40 years, including Ricky Skaggs and Brendan Powers, in styles ranging from blue- bluegrass to jazz. He is P.T. Gazelle. Hi, P.T. How are you doing today? Hi, Tomlin. Good to be here, man. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, so for, for listeners who don't know where you are, whereabouts are you based? I'm just outside Nashville. It's the Nashville, Tennessee area. I don't live right in the city, but I'm, uh, I'm close. Very, not, not too Very cool. So how, how is it, how's it looking in, in current situation uh, in your, your neck of the woods? Well, if we're talking about weather, it's early spring here and the colors are gorgeous and the, all the flowering trees are uh, gorgeous this year. And the weather is, it's a little chilly, but it's its really quite pleasant here. Um, in terms of uh, what's going on in the world, um, I don't think we're as bad quite right here. Hopefully it's not going to get any worse. So we'll see what happens. I, I like that you you led with with uh, something more pleasant than uh, than the, the thing that we're we're all talking about all the time. Uh, it's good yeah. that that spring is kicking in. Uh, I've noticed that that we're getting a ton more birds in the city, uh, which is really quite quite lovely. It's uh, it's a shame that it's uh, the circumstances that that we've got that have led to it. But um, yeah, apparently apparently wildlife is enjoying not having so many people around <laughs> so that's, that's uh, not a big surprise is it <laughs> no um yeah i heard that the pollution has has kind of dropped by like 50 percent in in big cities in the uk and I'm, I'm assuming it's the same over there even even i don't live in the city and we don't have a terribly bad uh pollution problem in the nashville area but even at that it seems like the skies have been a lot clearer so Oh, that's cool. Let's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's the kind of thing to to focus on. Um, but part of me is kind of hoping that uh, this might lead to a bit of a revolution in terms of people working from home more and maybe traveling less, uh, you know, in their cars to get to work and uh, kind of saving on on pollution. But uh, who knows? We might just go back to kind of how <laughs> how we liked things before. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so for, for you um, specifically, I, I don't I don't really know whether you're an, an indoor or an outdoor kind of person. I'm uh, I'm both actually. I I enjoy being outside. Uh, when I'm able to, I go play golf. So um, you know, um, I had big plans of playing a lot more this year, but <laughs> obviously that's <laughs> that's been put on hold for a while. So. Uh, no, I do. My wife and I, um, we like to take we like to take vacations where we we spend time outside and do a, a bit of hiking and and that sort of thing. So, 
Yeah. See that, that? I mean, that golf feels like it, it's potentially quite a good social distancing exercise. Yeah, it should be. It should be. Um, I, right now, I'm not sure there's really too much open, and I'm, I, I, I'm a little. Right now, I think another couple of weeks might be a better idea not to not to indulge. So, at least for me. No, I think I think that's fair enough. So, in in the kind of the current thing of of being more more indoors than normal, does it feel mm-hmm. like a, an opportunity to work on projects that maybe you didn't have time to before? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It, it, it you know here I don't I don't know about the UK, but but here um, I did a gig on March. Ninth, and that was my last gig. March tenth in this country, pretty much the alarm button went off in this country, and literally within another day, like by March eleventh, there were no more gigs. I mean, it had stopped that that quickly. Yeah. And almost within two days after that, I started getting calls to do things like this, but that we're doing today. I started mm-hmm. getting. Um, online harmonica overdub sessions, which I don't actively pursue. I do a handful every year, um, but I don't. I don't actively pursue it. Um, I have a little. I have a nice little setup here in this room. I've got some quality mics and some nice preamps and Pro Tools, and and I can do it. And I do do it. But and that cha- you know, and that started. And um, I believe it or not, I think a lot of people also spent some time and said, you know, I've got a little bit of time. I've been meaning to think about a gazelle method harmonica. I'm going to go explore it. They go to the website and they look around and, you know, that business has seemed, if, if anything, it's upticked just a little bit. So that's great. That's that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny. Yeah. I was actually we'll, we'll talk about the gazelle method uh, maybe a little bit later. But sure. uh, I, when I was kind of prepping for this, um, I, I was I was looking through your your harmonicas and thinking, you know, maybe maybe I should become a, a half valve player. Um, and this is the problem because I'm chatting to so many interesting harmonica players at the moment for this podcast, sure. and I come away from every single session thinking, oh, I'm going to completely rethink everything. And I'm going to be like <laughs> this guy or this guy. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, um, it is a temptation. It, it's certainly a temptation. And I'm probably not a very good businessman because people contact me much like yourself, you know, all the time and say, God, you know, I ran across what you're doing and I read a little bit about it. But I, you know, and I'm thinking about revamping my entire, you know, thing. And I go, time out, you know, time out. <laughs> how, how many years have you spent, you know, practicing and trying to do overbending? Five years and you're and you're not bad at it. You're going to have to completely relearn what what you're doing so are you sure you want to go down this road i would love to sell you an instrument but at the same time are you sure you know i'm trying to give people the bigger picture of it right because in my opinion in my opinion the overbending technique and the half valved approach are equally hard to master okay one isn't easier than the other, mm-hmm. okay? And so it's, you know, are you sure you want to do that? People starting out or people who have never tried to overbend before, it may be a great, it may be a great, you know, avenue for them to look at and see, you know, buy one and say, go, yeah, I think this is going to work for me. Yeah, you know? so I, I, okay, I think, I think we, should, we should maybe go a little bit deeper uh, so that listeners know uh, what you're talking about with the, with the, the kind of the half-valved sure. thing. So do you want to give a, a brief overview of what a half-valved harmonica is? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have, and I've got, I've got, one, I've got one exploded here that we can look at. So... This is this is uh, an audio only, so I'll, I'll we'll we'll describe what what you're seeing. Okay. Okay, I see, I see. So they're not getting. So basically, on a harmonica, on a harmonica, we've got a top plate and a bottom plate. The top plate is our blow plate, right? Mm-hmm. And the bottom plate is our draw plate. And if if we put a valve or a wind saver on the first six draw slots. So these are the ones that would look, they would be inside the harmonica when you look in the holes of the comb. 
okay? Because the slots when on the that go up against the bottom of the comb is not where the actual reed is on the draw plate. The, the reeds are on the bottom of the plate underneath the, the reed plate cover. The opposite is true. Uh, or, or then on the on the blow plate, we put the blow plate on top, and if I put a and I put a valve on the top four blow slots, and those are visible underneath the reed plate cover as opposed to the ones on the draw plate, which are inside the comb. So that's kind of how it's arranged. It's called half valving because there are ten total valves out of a possible twenty reed slots that we could cover so there's 10 of them so that means it's half of the harmonica so what happens when we put it let's talk about richter tuning just for a second we all under most of us play richter tuning most of us a lot of us play in second position or first position uh, some other positions third minor there are missing notes there is there are missing notes on a Richter tuned harmonica. So even if I want to in second position, even if I want to just simply play the do re, the major scale in second position, starting on hole two draw, I'm still missing the note, right? That next note's missing. Yeah. It's not there. Da, because I got. It's a half step flat. Mm -hmm. That's the way Richter tuning is. Okay. So that's, that's the conundrum, right? And there's many different ways to get around the missing notes nowadays. There's people that do alter, uh, alternate tunings. One of them would be country tuning, where we take that missing note, we take the five draw that's a half step flat to try and get the major scale, and we tune it up a half step. That gives us that note and then if we want the, to the note that we retuned we would just draw bend down okay another way to do it would be to overblow that note you would overblow hole four i believe yeah you would overblow hole four and raise the pitch up by half step v valved bending means that i can now blow bend hole six down a half step to get the missing note that's hole six. So I'm blow bending down to get that missing note. Okay. That's basically the very general view of it. Okay. There's three reasons that I decided that half valving. And I should preface this by saying valving diatonics, the thought of valving a diatonic has been around a long time. Vaudeville guys from years ago, people like Bernie Bray, who's quite a familiar name for harmonica historians, used to put a, one or two valves on his harmonica so that he could play tunes that required that, that one or two missing notes that we don't have. And it was like a big trick, you know, people that knew something about music and, and heard things would listen and go, wow, how did he do that? And of course, everything back then was a big secret and very hush-hush-hush, and nobody knew how the, you know, they did that, except a few select people. Well, Brendan Power figured out that if he put, on Richter tuning, if he put a valve across the first six draw slots and the top four blow slots, like I've just described, he could fill in the missing notes and add some other elements to his playing. My contribution to it is the problem was people were using um, plastic wind savers like you would use in a chromatic. And they popped and rattled and, and stuck mm -hmm. and everything else. Everything that people that play chromatic hate about wind savers. Same problem, only even worse in a diatonic because the hole, the chamber is so small, okay? So I spent a, quite a bit of time and did some research and just kept testing material and testing material and finally came up with a valve that is stiff enough to function as an opening and closing device, but soft enough not to pop and rattle and snap 
and is very moisture resistant and temperature resistant. And then I started looking, I've, after I solved that problem, I thought, well, but how do, maybe there's a setup on the harmonica for half valve playing in terms of reed shaping and gapping to accommodate half valve playing better. Because if you think about it, overblowing, overbending, there's a certain philosophy to gapping a certain way, the blow and draw read in a hole, to help facilitate an easier overbend. Well, the, 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 the same is true with, with half valving. So there's a certain setup that's going to allow me to not only play the valve bends soft if I want them, but if, if I hit them hard, they're not going to choke out either. Okay, so it, for instance, like this. I'm playing that pretty softly. There's not much effort there. If I want to play it hard, I can do that too. If I want to, and this is very important, if I want to just go spot on to a valve bend, I've got the harmonica set up to do that. That's my six blow bend spot on mm -hmm. without having to slide into it. Okay? So... Um, the three reasons I play a valve setup, half valve setup, number one, I'm able to fill in the missing notes. So let's just talk about that just for a second. In the chromatic scale, those of you that can bend pretty well on holes two and three draw in second position, you're only missing two notes in the chromatic scale. You're only missing the flatted sixth and the major seventh. And that, for me, ends up being the blow bend on hole five and the blow bend on hole six. Those are the only two notes you're missing. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to now play like a chromatic scale in second position. Let's just do that. Right? So the two missing notes are five blow bend. So there's, there's a complete chromatic scale in the first octave of second position. I can continue on and do it in the second, in the top octave as well. In first position, I have three complete chromatic scales. Okay. So that's one reason. The second reason is, and this is kind of a, kind of a part of it as part of a history of me. I quit playing in 1988. I walked away from the instrument completely because I was very frustrated with the fact that I couldn't do what you're hearing me do right now without like having to stack up two, har two or three harmonicas. And it never seemed very fluid or a, a good way to make that happen. And I didn't want to play chromatic harmonica because I like the sound of the diatonic harmonica. So I, in essence, missed the whole revolution and the whole start of the overbend or overblow phenomenon. I wasn't influenced by it at all. That's about the time Howard Levy started to become a household name in about 87 or 88. And I just missed it totally. Didn't even know what it was. And when I started, made the decision to start playing in 2003, people showed me about overbending and I was able to actually do it. But I, I kept telling them, well, that's the wrong note. And they kept saying, well, no, 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 that's right. And I went, but no, 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 I just want to flat this note. And they went, well, you can't do that. that you, there's no way to do that. And so I was just, it's a long story. But at any rate, through a series of events, we end up now with being able to play half-valved. And the logic for me of flatting the note, whether it's blow or draw, all the way up and down the harmonica, was the way I grew up playing the instrument. Mm -hmm. I always, when you bent a note, you flatted the note. It went down a half step or more, depending on what hole you were in. So it logically just made more sense to me. If I want to 
just blow bend six or five. Which incidentally is the octave of eight and nine. Which are blow note bends, which we all do. We can do those blow bends at the top without valves. So the, the logic of flatting the note makes more sense to me. Filling in the extra notes was a great plus. The third thing, and I consider this one to be really, really essential, is that I'm able to add emotional shading and coloring to not only some of the reeds on the harmonica, but all 20 reeds. What do I mean by that? What do people like about the diatonic harmonica? Four draw. Four draw is maybe the first note we, we learn to bend, first thing. That emotional wah, 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 that emotional ah, it's voice-like, it's emotional, right? I can do that on any read on the harmonica now, not just the draw reads at the bottom or the blow reads at the top. I can do it all over the harmonica. Here's blow notes. At the top of the harmonica, I can now draw bend. Those are draw bends on 7, 8, 9, and 10. So I've got emotional shading all over the harmonica. It's more like a complete instrument for me. Yeah, it's super interesting. It's interesting what you're saying about um, the note layout making more sense to you because I, I think I... I discovered you after I'd been overblowing for a little while and sure. and I loved the sound and so I rushed out and bought a, a valved harmonica but it, it wasn't it wasn't as idle um I think it was uh -huh. a, a Suzuki Promaster yeah um and the, the note layout just felt so wrong to me because uh, <laughs> in the, exactly the way that you've described it it would be wrong for you for, for me, it's it's wrong the other way, not Absolutely. having the you know the flat third on the sixth blow and yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and yeah, I get my flat third on the seven drawback. Uh -huh. Right, so I get it by doing a draw bend on seven. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but. I feel that your your method is so much more logical. You know, if 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 someone logical was sitting down and designing the instrument, yeah. what, what you've done makes so much more sense. And and I'm a little bit annoyed at myself for having invested <laughs> so much brain power into getting over the idiosyncrasies of the instrument and the note layout. Yeah. Well, I think I think you're not alone. I think there's there you know there's many there's many players. Uh, several of them come to mind. Uh, Jason Rosenblatt. I don't know if you're familiar with Jason Rosenblatt. He's out of Montreal in Canada. No, I'll check Brilliant him out. player. Brilliant player, and um, great over overbender. Spectacular and a great, just a great musician. And um, I gave him one of my harmonicas, and and he played it, and he was like, I really wish I had, <laughs> you know. I really wish I had thought, you know, had this available when I made the decision, you know, to diverge and go one way or the other. He mm -hmm. said, but right now it'd be just, it'd be crazy for me to set this down, you know, yeah. and, and start over. So. That's the thing is, 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 it's all that muscle memory and all that kind of foundational work. Well, and that's right. And, and that's right. And honestly, what's interesting, and this is just a, a funny aside, um, and I don't have one because I just don't play everything I have is valved and, and nothing is, I just don't have anything unvalved. But if somebody hands me a harmonica that's set up for overblowing and I go to hole six, for instance, and I go to blow bend the note like it was valved, I do an overbend. Right. Now it's not great. I mean, cause I would have to practice it. The technique is slightly different, mm -hmm. but it's not that much different. So what it tells me and, and some of my, myself and se several other people that teach online, you know, good players, we refer to it as the pro embouchure. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is an embouchure that whether you tongue block or purse, there's a, there's an embouchure, a pro embouchure that, that kind of facilitates you being able to, to, 
to pretty much play anything. Okay, mm. you can kind of move through things. It's and it all starts with being able to accurately do blow bends at the top of the harmonica because it requires a much more pronounced and focused and controlled embouchure to do blow bends at the top, and you can translate that and improve on it to do over bends and half valve playing. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And have you have you uh, discovered anything? from kind of the the overblow side that you think this this is this is something that's missing from half valve yeah. playing what like what yeah, is that absolutely yeah absolutely when i hear people when i hear people like will wild and when i hear jason ricci play and when i hear uh um uh what's his name Con is it constantine reinfeld yeah yeah when i hear him play um i think i think for quick really quick articulated guitar like or in some sense blues like passages somehow it seems like the overbend technique seems to seems to lay in the pocket differently mm -hmm. and it just sounds differently um when it's done well and of course howard i mean howard can play just about anything right i mean i mean when i hear it and what i don't hear and it's just, and it could be because most, a lot of these players aren't concentrating on that genre is, and again, of course, you always have to exclude Howard because he can do it virtually anything. <laughs> um, I don't hear a lot of people using their overbends and sustaining very long overbends as part of a melody, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's used in a passing, a passing phrase, it's used brilliantly. OK, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's guys that are doing it. I, I don't want to catch any flack about that. But I uh, I think that's the main divergence for me. Mm -hmm. And it just depends on what, you know, Tom, when it depends on what you're trying to play. Um, I don't think what Jason Ricci is doing, I don't think half valving would translate as well for him. I really don't. You know, mm -hmm. some of the some of the stuff he's doing, imitating a guitar. I mean, where those pass, some of those overbends are just little passing notes, but they're accurate pitch wise, I think works brilliantly yeah. as opposed to having it sound like a bend on a, on a half valved harmonica. Now, turn that over and talk about playing a ballad on, diaton on Richter tune diatonic. In my opinion, the half valving lays better. Okay. And for swing music, where I'm trying to, like the little thing I was doing at the front of the, of the podcast here, the, when you're trying to play and imitate more like a clarinet or a trumpet or something, to me, the half valving kind of lays in the pocket better. So it's kind of genre driven. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think there's a lot in that. And I think, yeah, the, the articulation is, is what I really notice is, is the, the big, big difference um yeah. and also an, another thing that I, I think is is kind of interesting about instruments in general is mm -hmm. we we all play uh phrases that are mechanically laid out in front of us kind of in an advantageous manner so yeah. there are kind of fast runs on harmonica that if a guitarist tries to play them they think you know how how are they getting this sequence of notes and, and what i kind of visualize as quite interesting between half valve and overblow players is that mm -hmm. those those little runs are different for for the valve player versus the overblow player which Absolutely. is kind of cool <laughs> no it is and and, and again you, you know if you to me right now is the golden age of diatonic harmonica if you can't find something that works for you in what you're trying to achieve on diatonic harmonica you need to play a different instrument because you've got you've got half valved Richter tuning, you've got uh, harmonicas that are set up for overbend in Richter tuning, you've got alternate tuning harmonicas, you've got the the stuff Brendan Powers putting out, which is you know uh, all kinds of crazy things to be <laughs> able to play you know stuff that you can't really do, and you've got four major five now five major harmonica manufacturers putting out several different models and the game has been up by everybody i mean it's it's like everybody makes a quality instrument okay and if you can't find something that works for you you should really switch man you should switch <laughs> at this point 
Yeah, it's uh, it, it sounds like um, a lot of the the really exciting players now. So pe- people like you and Howard um, and Jason, you know, people who kind of started pr- practicing styles that uh, I'm going to say are kind of part of the modern harmonica repertoire. Uh, right. You were all doing it on instruments that maybe weren't that great. Um, no. In terms of quality. No, even even when and, and again, I laid off from 88 to, to 2003. I didn't play a note. I, in fact, I thought I was done. I figured I'll never play again. OK, but um, before I quit, I mean, all we had was the old Marine bands with the with the little brass nails in them on the pear wood combs that were gang sawed. And mm. I mean, they were like it looked like a washboard. You took the reed the, the reed plate off and that wood was it looked like a washboard. I mean. You couldn't get, I mean, every one out of 15 harmonicas might play worth a hill of beans, you know? Mm-hmm. And, the, and so it was it was a struggle to even just play the instrument. You had to really play well to just get any kind of, you know, control over the instruments. And even in 2003, when I started again, you could see the door was opening and people were starting to up their game a little bit with the instruments due to people like Felisco who had started to customize harmonicas and other players were going, why can't the harmonica companies do this? You know, even to a small extent, come on guys. And I, I'm a sidle guy, I, you know, and, and at the risk of sounding like, you know, the company guy, to me, sidle kind of, really made everybody up their game. They came out with some really high quality fit and finish harmonicas when they reemerged from being behind the iron curtain. And uh, I think everybody, you know, I think the other manufacturers kind of went, okay, you know, at first they went, well, nobody's going to pay that kind of money for a harmonica. But guess what? People did. And they went, yeah, these are worth the money. This is, mm-hmm. this is more like a real instrument. And the other and the other manufacturers, to their credit, up their game. And now, I mean, Suzuki and Honer and Seidel and Lee Oscar and uh, even East Top to some to some extent. I mean, everybody's making a much better instrument, man. They're making good instruments. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing that kind of I have to to keep explaining to students when you know, especially when they're starting to learn things like overblowing. And mm-hmm. they start saying, oh, well, you know, I think it's time that I got a, a custom custom instrument so that I can I can do this. And and to be honest, I, I almost always find that out of the box harmonicas are, are ready or need very minimal work yeah. to, to get ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and, and it's true, you know, and, it, and, 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 and we're seeing it and they <clears throat> and I feel like the, the companies, all of them have been very responsive to what players are telling them. Also, I mean, there was a big push for an out-of-the-box harmonica that would overbend right out of the box, right? Mm -hmm. So I think they went, I honestly think all of them went a little too far in that direction because there was a there's a lot of players in this world that play diatonic harmonica and aren't interested in playing overbending. And the and the gapping was so close that they couldn't hardly play the instrument, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't have the control or the breath control or the just the muscle control to be able to play that instrument hard enough how they wanted to play it without it choking out, right? Mm-hmm. So I think the company's all adjusted for that, and I think they've loosened some of the gapping up, and now it's, you know, with what you, like you say, right out of the box, most of them are pretty good. If you're trying to play the overbend technique, it requires a minimal amount of, of setup for you mm-hmm. to kind of get there. Um, the half valving, uh, I think Suzuki's is pretty good. I, I, again, they're using the plastic wind savers, which to me are the big, is a big drawback because it's, if you're just a casual player, it's probably fine. What I noticed and the reason I went down this path was I recorded myself and I went, well, I'm here in the valves. I can't, I can't do that. I mean, custom, you know, clients that hire me to do something or if I do my own recordings I'm not going to want to hear that so that's what kind of sent me down the road with Mm -hmm. that um but yeah I think in general um companies have been very responsive and are and are really thinking about this more like a real instrument yeah no I I think it's uh yeah I like I like this idea of 
um, kind of a, a golden era of, of, of harmonica, both in terms of, of players and in terms of instruments. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm wondering if um, do you, do you think that that maybe struggling with less than optimal instruments led to players getting better, you know, kind yeah. of really push their technique? And are we going to kind of move away from that now? Now that it's it, you know the instruments are pretty easy to play. Mm, boy, that's a tough question. I, I will tell you this. I I think. And I've always and I've always thought this, okay, even from day one. I the diatonic instrument is not a chromatic harmonica, okay? Mm-hmm. It's not a chromatic harmonica. And I don't try to, even though I have all the notes, and in theory, on a C harmonica, I should be able to play in all twelve keys on a single instrument, okay? why mm-hmm. i mean it's 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 a exercise in extreme gymnastics and who am i who am i impressing by doing that the audience doesn't know i mean my audiences that come to the show have no clue mm-hmm. that I, what all they know is whether or not it sounds good and it moved them emotionally so i try to play you know, I I can play in several different positions, but depending on where the song is keyed, you know, I don't have any trouble switching harmonicas. So to your point, it's I don't think I don't think it's going to limit people moving forward. Um, I think what you're going to see, and I think we're seeing it, is is a lot of people are picking how they want to use this new this new basket of tools that they have. And for me, I mean, it's like, I want to be able to play swing and, and jazz and ballads. Okay. That's kind of what I do. And I want to be able to pull it off flawlessly. People know I'm bending notes, but my idea is I want, I don't want them to know that I'm doing a valve bend. I want my valve bending to sound as good as my regular bending. Right. Um, when I hear Jason Ricci play, Jason Jason kind of has a sphere of genres he works in, and he does them brilliantly, and he does it to the fullest effect, right? And he and he and he entertains. That's what most of us seem to lose, man. We don't we don't we get so hung up on being able to play in D flat on a C harmonica that we lose all emotion and all. I mean, at that point, you should play chromatic. That's how it was laid out. It's laid out like a piano with the button, okay? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So. No, absolutely. Um, what, one thing I did want to ask you about with, you know, although you're, you're saying that, you know, it's not a chromatic instrument, yeah. you, you do play a, a genre of music that, yeah. that invites people to play through changes. Yes. And... Uh, a lot of that, you know, if, if you were if you were doing it on guitar or piano, uh, that that involves playing, you know, effectively different positions over different chords. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you handle that? Well, so now you've asked me the question that everybody asks me, and I never know how to answer because I'm not a theoried or schooled musician. I play entirely by ear. I basically my kind of, my methodology, if there is one, Tom, one is that. I pick, a, I pick a song I want to learn. And since I have all the notes, I learn to play the melody. And I learn to play the melody so well that by the time I've ingrained how to play the melody, somehow the changes have been infused into my mm-hmm. brain, into my thinking. And I don't have to think about that anymore. I can just play over those changes with the, with the melody basically running way in the back of my head. So I kind of know where I am and, you know, just by kind of listening to the bass player. And and I think some of it also has to do with the fact that a lot of the music I play has a certain form to it. So let's talk about form for a second. In blues, the basic, the very most basic form for blues is a one, four, five chord progression, right? Three chord mm-hmm. blues. Okay. Sure, there's variations of that. But... Over time, 
you get used to those changes and you get used to, you can almost anticipate where a song's mm-hmm. going to go if it's in that genre, even though you don't know the song. Okay. The same happens when we branch out and we start to play um, other brand, other styles of music that aren't normally associated with playing on the diatonic harmonica. Okay. And th- those forms sometimes, mo- a lot of times is an AABA form. Mm-hmm. And you start to get used to how that counts and how that feels and where those changes are going to come. And that kind of makes it easier too, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, the, the, the ear, the ear player versus the schooled player is, is not a bad thing at all. Cause I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've come across a bunch of players and students like I have who have impe- impeccable theory, yes. uh, but there's, there's, there's very little musicality um, yeah. and they might yeah. be, limited by the theory because you know something might not work but you'll hear it and think it's great (laughs) it's like anything else in life for me and this is me pontificating you know on the podcast at two months being shy of 67 years old there's a middle ground for everything okay Mm -hmm. at this point in my life i wish i knew some theory but i'm not going to spend any of my time worried about that anymore because I, I kind of do what I do and people seem to enjoy it. But at the same time, people that have done nothing but theory are only thinking about a lot of what I see a lot of times is they're thinking about, they're looking, they're analyzing chord changes and they're going, what scale works over these changes? And it sounds mechanical and it doesn't have any feeling or emotion to it, right? Mm. So I think there's a middle ground for everything. I've learned enough about being able to look at a like a Nashville number chart over the years, and and basically, you know that that F is one flat, you know mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Or the I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the key of F is one flat, you know that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But that I can I can kind of talk a little bit to other musicians about that stuff. But I think. And, and I'm going to try to explain this when I solo. And I think this is what you're asking. This is what you're asking. OK, my thought process when I solo here, here's here's kind of what I do after I learn the song really, really well. And I don't have to worry anymore about knowing where I am in the progression and that I understand the progression, the, the chord changes. I typically try to come up with some kind of lick that is a leaping off point for me in a solo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not always, but a large percentage of the time I like to pick a lick that I like to come up with something. I'll just sit a lot of times and listen to the, listen to the track and hum something. And I'll go, well, that might be cool way to start and do that. And then from there, how I'm thinking about it is I'm thinking, okay, that was phrase a, I want to now connect that to phrase B and I want to connect that now to a phrase C, but I want all three of these to sound coherent like I'm writing a little tune inside. Mm-hmm. I'm writing an alternate melody line to the chord changes and the melody that already exist. And that's kind of how I do it. Sometimes I do it better than other times. So it's it's almost kind of uh, improvisation, but that there's more of a planning planning element to it there's a certain amount of planning not not a lot because then you you start to lose the magic you know yeah. you start to lose the magic um <clears throat> but there there a lot of times i i do try to get a jumping off point for myself and then i just try to it's just kind of stream of consciousness how do i for instance if i if and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna play something here let me just see so <laughs> Okay, baba doo boo da ba ba. Where do I go from there? What's what's going to be my second phrase? Okay, it, it, kind of the same amount of notes, kind of the same phrasing, but I've I've varied the I varied mm. the first lick to the second lick. So I mean that's kind of that's P T Gazelle's you know stream of consciousness mm-hmm. if there is one. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And it, it resonates a lot with, with how uh, I think about improv and also how I try and 
uh, explain improv to students. It's kind of there's you know there's a, there's a ton of practice of improvisational ideas of strategies. Yes. And then when you start actually you know playing versus practicing, you, yeah. you might have a notion you know a topic of conversation that you start with. There you go. And and then it's a string that that leads on from there. And yeah, yeah. I, I I can get behind that and definitely. I also I also tell I also tell my online students, excuse me. I also tell my online students, um, you've got, you already have, I call it a basket of riffs or licks that you play. Okay. Even if you're just playing simple blues, even if you're just playing, okay, that kind of stuff, right? Even if you're just doing that, that's a lick that you have. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, you need to be able to draw on memory inside of a song and you need to take five of your patented licks and string them together. Okay. This is how, this is how you can start to build a solo and then go listen to other players or go listen to something other than harmonica players and hear how other instruments might play over those same changes. And it's going to sound different. Steal a few of those. A lot of this stuff is accessible for the diatonic in like second position. There's a lot, again, you're only missing two notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not missing a lot, okay? So grab a few of those and intersperse them with your basket of licks and add them to the overall big thing and then try to make something coherent out of all that. Yeah, I think I think that's a, an excellent way to think about it. And, and uh, listening to other musicians I think that's a huge deal. Not not harmonica players, other other instruments. Um, right. And I feel right. that, that that's something I can hear in your playing. Um, that you know you haven't just listened to the classics, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with listening to the Walters and and, and the Sunny Boys. But um, I, I think there's there's something to be gained from maybe listening to more horn players. I feel like you you've probably listened to a lot of horn players. Am I right? A lot of clarinet and a lot of trumpet and uh -huh. sax to a certain extent, but it only it depends on who who we're talking about. Like for ballad playing, I, I like to I like to source. Uh, there's a couple of sax players I like to to source for for uh, ballad playing because I just I just think in that respect they can get a lot of emotion, you know, because mm -hmm. they can they can kind of with their embouchure they can kind of shade and, and emotionally do notes too but for faster stuff clarinet and 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 trumpet i mean trumpet's a great source i think i mean this kind of stuff where i'm doing tongue tapping mm -hmm. you know i mean trumpet players do that kind of stuff all the time you know and i just think a lot of that is super accessible for the harmonica yeah that's uh, that's interesting. I I, um, I I have to admit that I I've had a, a a kind of I've moved away from trying to do things outside of the blues realm on harmonica. Um, you know I I because I, I came to harmonica from guitar, and I wanted to to be able to play any any genre like I would on a guitar. You know I used to play in wedding bands and things, so I sure. I'm kind of comfortable playing a ton of stuff um like that but then i picked up the harmonica and it's like where, where are all these notes where are all the lines that i want to play um and only recently i i've started saying well you know i maybe i uh, i do just play blues and r&b and and kind of funky type genres but now talking to you and, and you know you, you say that there are only two no two notes missing which feels like a hell of a lot sometimes <laughs> but yeah but it, but it's but if you if you break it down to me when you break it down that way what is that what is that saying to guys that are people that are overwhelmed men and women that are overwhelmed when you even when you tell them that and when i tell them but can you are you already have you already mastered the five semitone draw bends you can do on holes two and three if you haven't then you got work to do because right there you're missing out on between holes one and four we're not talking about overbending and we're not talking about half valve playing we're not talking about alternate tunings we're talking about just regular bending on a richter tune diatonic 10 hole right mm -hmm. there are what seven bends yeah there's seven bends that you can do between hole one and hole four <laughs> yeah and if you can't do all those 
that's where you need to be concentrating because once you get those mastered, then you literally are only missing mm-hmm. two notes in the scale. Yeah, no, it's it's true, it's true. And there's there's so much meat down there. I think that's what, yeah. what people quite often forget is that you can yeah. kind of play everything in, in the lower octave and get so much mileage. Sure, but it but it requires practice. Mm-hmm. It requires practice. You have to your bending technique has to be good, and your pitch has to be good. Because if you're not hitting those semitones in two and three draw on pitch, then it's kind of useless. Mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, what Charlie McCoy made an entire career and revolutionized second position playing by being able to play melodies utilizing the two and three hole draw bends. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so let, let's uh, just just take a, a slightly uh, different direction. I, I, I want to find out a little bit more about uh, your kind of uh, uh, early days of, of playing because sure. you, you definitely weren't uh, the, the kind of jazzer that we uh, know and love now. Um, you were kind of more, more in the sort of country and bluegrass uh, yeah. genres. How, how did it all start? Well, you know, I, I, I was around... I grew up outside of Milwaukee, which is only 90 miles from Chicago. And it was a, Milwaukee was a regular stop on the blues circuit. I mean, you could, I mean, I saw people like, you know, I saw Muddy Waters, I saw James Cotton, I saw Charlie Musselwhite, uh, local guys like Jim Liban. Um, and I mean, I was exposed to the instrument early on. And it was, I was always taken with it when somebody could play it well because it was like a magic trick, right? You can't see what you're doing. Yeah. They've got this thing, they got their hands in front of their mouth and they're getting all this sound and all this music out of that little instrument. So I was exposed to it early on, but I didn't particularly have any interest in playing blues. I loved it. I loved to hear guys that could play it well. I kind of fell in with guys that were playing folk music. And this is when I'd first started playing. And so I kind of fell into doing that. And I always was kind of melodically driven, um, trying to play little lines in back of what they were doing. Okay. And from there, it kind of progressed to discovering bluegrass. And I got kind of taken for a while trying to play fiddle tunes on the harmonica. And did that for a while. And then through a series of events, I was living in Kentucky and I, and I landed a job with a country artist named Johnny Paycheck. Uh, And so I moved to Nashville and the guys in the, in the Johnny Paycheck band, a lot of them had come from Western swing backgrounds. And this was another whole genre of music I had never been exposed to. Okay. And I just, flipped out when I heard this stuff. And so these guys expected me to be able to be part of the section in the group. We had a, we had a a steel guitar and a regular guitar and I needed to be the third, I needed to be the third piece. Mm -hmm. So I had to really up my game. And of course that involved me stacking up two and three harmonicas to play some of these real complicated parts they wanted me to play with them, three-part, you know, section stuff that was real prevalent in Western swing. And it evolved from there to really being taken with playing that and starting to dabble in, you know, Benny Goodman kind of stuff and Louis Jordan kind of stuff, the more complicated Louis Jordan stuff. And then I as I said, I got really, really frustrated and walked away from the instrument because I just couldn't make it happen the way I thought it should. Um, and when I came back and through the whole synchronicity of half valving, I could now do exactly what I wanted to do, what I'd always wanted to do, and then really delved into playing <clears throat> swing and um, classic jazz standards and uh, American songbook uh, kind of stuff and ballads because I just felt like this was a, a, an area that nobody had really tapped on the diatonic to mm-hmm. a great extent and it just fit what I what I always had heard yeah, yeah it's uh, you, you you did 
I, yeah, I feel like you came came up with a, a very different sound um, that also made perfect sense, uh, which was amazing. But I'm I'm really intrigued by you, you've mentioned it a couple of times, but this this period of time between you know the the late eighties and the the yeah. early noughties where yeah. you didn't play harmonica. Um, yeah. What were you doing? Actually, I you have to go back quite a ways when I when I got out of high school. I intended, I did go to one year of university and I intended to do something in um, either radio or television. And I didn't, I dropped out of school after a year um, and discovered, I, and then started playing harmonica at age 19 and discovered that I could actually play harmonica and quickly started playing harmonica. Um, was, so it's funny, when I got disillusioned and tired of playing, not being able to play what I wanted to and traveling too much for my taste anymore and the grind of it, I walked away in 88 and didn't just decided I wasn't going to play anymore and decided I was going to try and break back in to do post-production audio for film and television, meaning editing dialogue, recording um, voiceovers, editing voiceovers, uh, adding sound effects, doing mixing, uh, doing sound design, that sort of thing. And uh, I did that for, gosh, a long time. I did that. When I started playing again in 2003, I was still doing that and did that together concurrently, music and post-production audio for Oh, about another four or five years. In 2010, I, I finally walked away. I retired from doing post-production audio and pretty much only play music now. That's, that's cool. So you do your own production when you're recording harmonica? The last, the last CD, the most recent project, the Loft Sessions, um, I, we recorded it here at the, right in this room that you're looking at, actually. Cool. Two of the guys, two of the guys were in here, and I was just down that hallway just for a little bit of isolation on the harmonica. Nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it worked out, it worked out brilliantly. I, I couldn't be happier with this project. So, um, yeah, I know enough about it to be able to do that and be able to do, uh, you know, online sessions on my own. People send me a track and go, we want to har add harmonica here. And so, uh, that, and, uh, and I actually, I, I, <clears throat> my old boss, from post-production days kind of suckered me into teaching at Belmont University one day a week. So I actually do that as well. I teach post-production audio one day a week, uh, which is which has been kind of fun teaching the next generation of, of filmmakers. And uh, a little frustrating right now with what's going on because it's all shift to online. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a little it's a little more challenging, but um, we're hoping that all hands out so yeah no i i think this is this is a kind of recurring theme with everyone i i speak to of uh the kind of multiple lives as as a oh, yeah. musician um yeah. and i think it, it's it's yeah. really important for um well as much as anything getting a little bit of clarity uh as to kind of what you want to be doing and and not compromising um because, yeah, I think it's quite easy to just do every gig that, that you can get your hands on because, you know, we're, we're, we're all hungry. It's that kind of musician hustle mentality. And if you can walk away and have a break, that's uh, a really healthy thing. I found coming back and when I when I decided to come back, of course, I was a lot older then and, and, and more mature, you know, in my opinion. And I just kind of looked at it like, man, you got to almost be a renaissance person at this point. I mean, you got, you can't just, you have to have a bunch of revenue streams, you know? And I tried to, and I tried to kind of like shape them all around, you know, either music or post-production sound so that I was happy, you know? And I mean, you know, I've got the gazelle method harmonicas that, you know, that's a revenue stream for me. I've got online teaching, which is an, a revenue stream for me. I teach at the university, so that's a revenue stream. I've got uh, some some students that I give lessons to, um, you know, on and on. So mm -hmm. it's, but they're all kind of under one umbrella, and it's 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 nice, yeah. nice. 
Definitely. Well, I, I, I want to be mindful of your time, which you've very kindly uh, given to me today. Uh, this has been fantastic. But uh, is there anything cool. that you want uh, the listeners to to check out? Anything you want me to you know uh, promote? If, if, if you'll go to if you would go to my website ptgazelle.com, you can you can. There's pretty detailed information and photos about the Gazelle Method harmonica there. We have two different models. One is the 1847 silver Gazelle Method, which has my valves and setups. And then we have one, which is their Session Steel model. And that's the Gazelle Method Session Steel. Um, both of them are there. I also build, I'll build you a custom sidle if you want it. If you decide that you want something other than that, I'll be glad to build a, a custom sidle for you, you know, with other parts. Very cool. Uh, my music's all there. I've got, I think it's six CDs, six projects that are sitting up, including the latest ones. And every single one of them is available as a download, too. You can get it right from me as a download, either, you know, as a full project, which is pretty nice. I just hit the button and it comes to you. So Brilliant. Uh, that's yeah. great. Well, that will all be in the show notes uh, so people can cool. click straight through. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. This has been uh, Man, a real pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> all right. Well, take care. Bye-bye. All right, that one. Thank you. Cheers. See you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping.